Mary Poppins' jolly holiday dress in the 1964 film, while gorgeous and iconic, isn't exactly what a woman in 1910 might actually have been wearing for garden frolic adventures. What she more probably would have been wearing was known in the period as a lingerie dress, a lightweight cotton or linen dress common for outdoor summer wear due to their lighter weight and color, and which often involved lots of frills and lace. This, I think, is what the original costume in the film was aiming for, whilst keeping it more familiar to its late 1950s slash early 1960s viewership. Firstly, let's talk about skirt shape. The film dress is giving us a nice 1950s T-length circle skirt supported by a light crinoline to give it that stylish, again, 1950s shape. But according to Edwardian tastes, this would have gone all the way to the floor. Rather than being cut in a circle, which allows an even fullness around the entire hem, the Edwardians were very fond of cutting their skirts in gourd panels, which kept the skirt smooth around the hips and down the front, but which would flare out into a full bell shape the hem. And these individual panels meant that this hem fullness can be controlled to be slimmer in the front and more flared towards the sides and back. The waistband isn't fit to be exactly the shape of the waist, as is usually the case with a circle skirt, but is made up with extra width in the back panels, which can be gathered up to give the skirt that quintessentially Edwardian smooth in the front, floofy in the back effect, which is actually a remnant of the last bustle period in the 1880s. This corselet thing is also sadly a product of the 1950s new look aesthetic, and I haven't personally ever come across anything remotely similar on Edwardian lingerie gowns. There are, however, a profusion of wide, colorful sashes seen on original lingerie gowns. My friend Abby very kindly sent me a ton of pictures of an original made from a silk moiré in her collection, which was super easy to recreate. So I found myself a nice silk moiré in that iconic Mary Poppins scarlet, and it's really just a wide rectangle hemmed on both edges, smooshed into whatever width shape you desire, stiffened with three little short stays at the front, and closed with hooks at the back. So they were nearly there with this corselet, only the white stays are meant to go on the inside. The other thing that is sadly missing from the film dress is the lace, and not just lace trimming, but full-on lace insertion, cutting through the panels of the fabric to give that intricate, partly transparent, but not because you're actually wearing a ton of layers underneath, quality that is so characteristic of lingerie dresses. Lace can be the trickiest aspect of a historical recreation. Styles of lace evolve dramatically over the centuries, and many of the historical patterns and qualities no longer are produced today. The wrong lace can throw off the entire look of a reconstruction, so it does help to look at a lot of original lace patterns online, in museums or antique shops, just so that you can start to develop an eye for which patterns feel real or appropriate for which period you're trying to work in, and you know what, or what not, to buy. For this project, I ended up buying 10 to 15 yard bolts of around six different styles and widths of lace just to have and to play around with. That way I could decide sort of in the moment on the form what patterns to make. Some of them, like that wide geometric one that I used for the skirt chevroning, I used every scrap of that lace and could have done with some more of that, but others, like the slimmer widths that I used in places on the bodice, I had vast amounts of leftover. Lingerie dresses of this period range from simple designs with just a single style of lace used in one or two places, but otherwise are mostly just fine cotton fabric with some frills here and there, to dresses which are almost entirely intricately pieced patchworks of lace manipulated to form smooth curves and shapes within a bodice or all around a skirt. There are some separate full videos for the design process, as well as the detailed skirt, blouse, and lace insertion processes if you fancy delving into the full year and a half long process for those. But as is my method, everything is made up entirely using period appropriate machinery for stitching. However, due to the fiddly nature of much of the construction, most of it ended up being done by hand. And this is something that we actually see on a lot of original lingerie dresses. Definitely lots of machine sewing, especially on some of these simpler examples, but the more complex ones can mostly, if not entirely, be hand sewn. This is the turn of the century era when the sewing machine has now been around for over 50 years and we start to see a charming resurgence of hand sewing in extant garments as a result of the novelty of the sewing machine starting to wear off. One of the extraordinary things about a project like this is the incredible creative freedom it allows. Many of these dresses were homemade originally, so it was up to the maker to decide how much detail to include and where that detail should go. 
As a result, I didn't use or draft a pattern for this particular project because there's kind of no way to really standardize this process. The skirt was vaguely based on this existing 1890s paneled skirt pattern that I drafted already, but I just cut it away at the knees to configure the lower chevron half and slimmed the panels a bit to accommodate the vertical lace insertion. The bodice was not patterned at all, but simply sort of grew into being as a result of draping more and more pieces of lace and gathered cotton on a dress form and then stitching it down. This really is probably one of the most unique types of garments in history, so it might come as a wonder that for all of the various patterns and materials used, they all tend to turn out a single defining Edwardian silhouette. Well, my friends, herein is where we begin the conversation about dressing. Because half the battle of historical reconstruction isn't in the construction at all, but it's in the foundational layers that give a garment the right shape and movement. Speaking of uniquely crafted things that still turn out similarly beautiful results, this video has been brought to you by Function of Beauty, purveyors of personalized hair care products designed to meet your unique hair goals and needs. Just as there is a lingerie gown to suit every flavor of Edwardian, Function of Beauty allows us in the 21st century to customize our hair care with personalized products made specifically for us. All you need to do is go online and fill out a quick quiz to input your hair type, hair goals, and any specific needs you might have. Function of Beauty will then send you a personalized formula, which you know is for you because it says it's for you. And the great thing about this is that you can change up the formula to suit different needs depending on the time of year. So frizz control to battle that sweet, salty summer humidity and perhaps some strengthening power for the drier winter months. My hair is always withstanding lots of twisting up and pinning and other, hmm, tomfoolery. <laughs> So I am a great utilizer of the strengthening and root nourishing options in particular. I've been using these products for many years now and they have most certainly got me through some rough times. <laughs> you can get 20% off your first 16 ounce custom set when you click the link in the description box below. The undermost layer of an Edwardian ladies' summer attire would either be a chemise or a pair of combinations as I'm wearing here. This pair is admittedly a bit fancier than what would have been worn for everyday purposes since the purpose of this is to put a durable and easily washable layer against the skin to absorb the sweat and skin grease and to protect the outer layers from needing regular washing. This is the skinmost layer, so theoretically they are not wearing underwears as we know them today. This is the one and only form of underwear, but for the purposes of this video I must disclaim that I am fully dressed because the internet is weird, so please excuse anything that you can see potentially showing through underneath that would not have been there historically. To make peeing not completely impossible underneath a corset, drawers at this point were still usually split open. But again, if you feel like getting weird, there is a full video on that subject. Over this, of course, goes the corset. This one is made up in the style of the 1890s, so isn't the straight front style that was prevalent by this 1910 era. I am admittedly slightly out of fashion in this respect for this dressing. The 1910 corsets also usually incorporated suspenders at the bottom to help hold the stockings up, which again, my earlier style does not do, so my stockings are held up a bit old-fashionedly with some garters. A corset cover is then worn over top of all of this to help smooth over the corset so no harsh edges show through in the outer garment. I don't actually own one of these <laughs> yet, so I'm using a, an earlier sort of mid 19th century chemise in place of this. Normally a corset cover is only the bodice portion, although a bit of extra skirt fluff will not go amiss in this circumstance and certainly won't be seen. And of course, some hip padding. We are no longer doing the full bustles by this period, but the quintessential hourglass bust waist hips ratio is still very much in favor in the Edwardian period. One option to achieve this, of course, is to tight lace your corset to smoosh your waist in really heavily, or just to be shaped like that naturally. But for the rest of us, bust and hip padding help to give that hourglass illusion without the discomfort of tight lacing. I've actually built some bust and hip padding into the corset itself, which sometimes could have been done and sometimes was not done. And this additional hip pad, of course, helps in the hips, but these supplements can be and were added or reduced according to the natural shape of the body. And that completes the foundation layers. Over top of all this fluff and padding and the corset helping to keep the abdomen upright, the dress will sit naturally 
very Edwardianly. The considered construction comes in very useful here in achieving that silhouette. The dense pleating, for example, at the back of the skirt allows, again, for more emphasis on the hips. The bodice is constructed in a way that the gathers are very dense just at the front, again, giving the dress that pigeon-fronted shape that was so fashionable in this period, but is rather sparsely gathered at the sides where the waist is meant to appear smaller. It is all about illusion, and though the effects of this might look dramatic or just straight up impossible by looking at some of the drawings of this period, it's all just a matter of careful layering. I'm not even laced down here at all. And finally, no Edwardian summer look is complete without a hat. This one is silk-covered straw decorated with some feathers and silk flowers and held securely to the head with a long hat pin. These hats are generally worn at jaunty angles and are quite shallow in the crown whilst being very large on the head, of course, so requires some additional securing since they won't sit tightly to the head otherwise. And now, I do believe we are ready for a little promenade in the park. Oh my god, there's so many dead moths. <laughs> 